Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 66, Napoleon Bonaparte, the Emperor himself. Before we begin, I'd like to remind all of our listeners that if you'd like to support our podcast, please go to patreon.com forward slash generals and Napoleon, where you'll find ad-free content and bonus content. If you'd like to support our podcast in other ways, please follow us on Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and wherever podcasts are heard. Now, on with the show. We have a very special guest on the line for this episode, one of my favorite authors, the great Andrew Roberts. How are you, Andrew? On top form. How are you, John? I'm very well, very well. Thank you so much for joining the show. Not at um, all. It's a, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with your show. I think it goes into, into just exactly the right amount of uh, detail. I think you get great uh, guests on. I really enjoy listening. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. I, when I started the show, I promised myself I would never do a Napoleon-only episode because I thought his marshals and generals and all of his opponents were just as interesting. But guess what we're going to talk about today? <laughs> well, yeah, but we can also talking about his opponents and his and his marshals. You know, it doesn't have to all be about uh, him. Sure, sure, true. Yeah, no, I'm just very excited. And um, for those of you not familiar with Andrew, um, first of all, he has a great book called Napoleon, A Life, which I've read multiple times. I highly recommend. But Andrew has written a number of books on a number of different subjects, correct? Yeah, I've written 20 books now. Um, there was one rather misconceived novel, but uh, the other 19 are all about, uh, are all history books or, or biographies. Very well. And uh, if you want to find Andrew's books, you can go to any independent bookstore. Uh, we like to keep those places in business and keep them going strong because they are very important, correct? Oh, vital. Absolutely vital for, for writers as well as readers. Indeed. Indeed. So let's jump in because we know Napoleon's life can be quite detailed. You've published, like we just discussed, a wide range of books on different time periods, on topics such as Churchill, Hitler, King George III, President Roosevelt. Why does Napoleon really stand out to you? Well, he's such a giant, isn't he? He's, uh, he's somebody who's had as many books written about him, by which I mean um, his name appears in the title or the subtitle, as there have been days since his death. Mm. Um, which gives you a sense, yeah. um, both of obviously how nerve wracking it is to try and write yet another um, biography of him, but also quite how important he is, quite what a um, influence he's had on uh, on European and world history. And so uh, he is somebody who sort of draws the attention. He's certainly drawn my attention ever since I was about 10 years old. Um, and my dad took me to watch the great Waterloo film mm. um, I have been fascinated by this man so when I had the opportunity actually to spend six years uh, visiting 53 of his 60 battlefields and writing about him uh, I jumped at the chance all right all right well I think that's a good explanation I um I myself I I was a history teacher for a little while and I taught world history but I one day at like you said a local bookstore I picked up a used copy of David Chandler's uh, Campaigns of Napoleon. Wonderful book. Oh, my. And I couldn't put it down. I was sitting on a beach and I just read it for five hours straight. And I said, oh, my gosh, I, I got to learn more about this, you know. And and from there, it kind of just touched off my interest in the subject. Um, I watched your famous debate with Adam Zamoyski on YouTube, which has over 800,000 views as of this recording on the idea that Napoleon should be called Napoleon the Great, and it's just fantastic. Um, I contend that he doesn't need the moniker. Some people just need one name, like people in music, like Prince, Madonna, Beethoven, and Mozart. Why is Napoleon such a divisive subject? It seems people either like him or hate him. There's not a lot of in-between on him. No, that's right. Um, uh, in England, we have the expression Marmite. He's Marmite, um, which is a... It's a um, a food a bit like ve vegemite i don't know if you have that in america <laughs> and and it's and the advertising people for uh, marmite um have the slogan you either love it or you hate it and <laughs> um and, and that's as you say it's quite true of uh, napoleon i think um it's quite clear 
why people can love Napoleon, um, and I'm sure we'll go into this. But I think pe the reason people hate him uh, is for slightly misconceived views. It's because they uh, very often, certainly this is true of British historians, um, especially British historians who grew up in the shadow of the Second World War, to, um, to essentially get Napoleon wrong and to see him as a kind of proto-Hitler figure, mm -hmm. which, which he absolutely was not. And right. On so many levels was not. And yet, um, because he was a dictator, of course, um, we tend to, and we do it the whole time with history, I'm afraid, we tend to try to see people in the past in the light of things that have happened since their deaths, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a pretty sort of moronically stupid thing to do, frankly, and we're going to be very angry once we die when people do it to us. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, uh, but nonetheless, it's, um, it's a scourge, especially a scourge of... of um, the modern way of looking at the past and unfortunately what because of what adolf hitler did um uh, napoleon's um napoleon's great achievements have been have been sort of damaged i think in the in the light of uh, of um subsequent events yeah i agree i um i think david chandler had a great quote on the comparison and it was something like it it could be nothing could be more flattering to hitler than me to compared to Napoleon and nothing could be more odious to Napoleon than be compared to Hitler, which I thought. So it. true. And also, I mean, look at Winston Churchill. Um, you kindly mentioned that I was the biographer of Churchill. Uh, he called um, Napoleon the greatest man of action since Julius Caesar. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, and he absolutely hated Adolf Hitler so, and certainly wouldn't have said anything positive about Napoleon if uh, he thought that um, Napoleon and Hitler had anything in common. In fact, one of the speeches he made during the Second World War explicitly rejected the idea that um, that Napoleon and Hitler had anything in common. Regarding Napoleon's biography, obviously it's, that's a long thing to get into, but what do you think is the most remarkable thing about his career? I, I'm, I'm kind of torn on this. People have different opinions. I just think that his accomplishments at such a young age were the most impressive, especially coming from almost minor nobility, almost nothing to the relative backwater that is Corsica. Please forgive my Corsican listeners for me saying that. But what do you think is the most remarkable thing about his career? Well, that's certainly one of them. Um, actually, I was in Corsica earlier this month um, on a trip to Corsica and Elba. And um, and that's certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to be a general uh, by the age of uh, of 24, to have won the battle at Lodi, of Lodi when, at the age of tw um, 26, to be mm -hmm. first consul by 30. I mean, these are incredible things. But uh, greater than that, it strikes me, is the success that his great reforms had, the endless massive reforms, especially the ones between 1800 and 1805, when he essentially managed to keep the best bits of the French Revolution and discard all the all the mad and nutty and and vicious ones. Right. That really, for me, that 1800 to 1805 period is the um, is the, the the period of incredible success. And of course, actually, it's also a period um, of peace. Which yeah. um, so I so I you know, of course, he was a conqueror. Of course, he was a soldier. You know, I visited 53 of his battlefields, so I'm under no illusions about that. <laughs> but but. It's the things that he built, the things that lasted. Um, right. You know, once Waterloo was over, all those uh, all, all those battles essentially um, are, uh, are dead and buried. But the things that carry on, like the Code Napoleon that carries on in the Rhineland until 1900 and forms the basis of European law today, these things really are um, what he called the the blocks of granite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Napoleonic Code, um, you know, getting France in order after basically a decade of disorder. Um, definitely, I think, are notable achievements, for, especially for a young man. Yeah. And the and the education system, the uh, Sorbonne, the Légion d'honneur, the Banque de France, the Cour de Comte, uh, you know, you name it. It's uh, it's just one amazing uh, reforming thing after another, the architectural um, and uh, infrastructural uh things that he that he built the man was was an absolute dynamo 
of, yeah. um, of reform, administrative reform, economic reform, you name it. He was able to, um, to, to, to change his nation and subsequently Europe. And, and when, he, when his armies marched into places, you know, he would impose these reforms. And uh, sometimes they went down well, sometimes they didn't. But, uh, but they, they were impossible to ignore and they really changed the way uh, people lived. Indeed. Well, let's touch on his wife, Josephine. Um, and this is a kind of a broad question. Do you think she helped him or hindered him? I know she spent his money lavishly and she had several affairs, as did he. But we also must remember that his empire did go into decline after their divorce. And I think she taught him how to act in royal circles and how to deal with other dignitaries. What is your feeling on Josephine? Very positive. I think she. I think she's a great woman. I think that um, I agree with everything you say, but I'd also add that um, she had a uh, a, a wonderful um, cultural influence on uh, on France. Um, you know, quite beyond the sort of philanthropy and all the other things that royals did in those days. She had a wonderful taste uh, mm -hmm. for, for paintings and porcelain and furniture and the Empire style and um, fashion and so on. You know, she uh, she really was able to um, to give his reign that kind of cultural uh, overview that um, that sets it apart really from a lot of other uh, contemporary um, contemporary reigns and also other French reigns. So, mm -hmm. so you know, he, she was, um, you only have to go to Malmaison, her beautiful uh, home outside Paris, to appreciate that this was somebody who uh, was redolent of, of style. And the Empire style, I think, is something that has uh, lasted long after her sad death in 1814 and, of course, his. Yeah, indeed. That's a great answer. Um, his family and members, same question could be asked. Did they help him or hinder him? Because clearly they weren't the best people, rather Machiavellian at times. Joseph, a failure as king of Spain. Jerome and Louis, not much better in their respective kingdoms. What do you think Napoleon should have done with these family members of his? He once joked at a dinner, <laughs> one of his many jokes, he's, he's, this is one of the reasons that he's nothing like Adolf Hitler. One of the many reasons is that he has a wonderful sense of humour. There are about 80 Napoleon jokes in my book. And, uh, and one of the great, I, well, I think one of the great gags he came out with was uh, when he was having dinner with his um, family and they were all arguing over which one should have which duchy and, you know, which hereditary bishopric and all that kind of business. And, uh, and he shrugged and <laughs> at the height of the argument. He said, anyone would think that we were, we were arguing over the bequest of our late father, the king. <laughs> you know, he he recognized even though they didn't yeah. that he uh, that it was all down to him that uh, that any of them were anything more than more than as you say minor aristocracy in fact um, one of the things that uh, is very noticeable in in Corsica is that that house in Ajaccio is um it's a very nice um house in the uh, in the middle of the uh, city. It's not the old city. It's not uh, terribly far away from the cathedral where um, his great uncle was Archbishop uh, Cardinal Fesch. Um, but, you know, it's not a, a genuine aristocratic house, especially as, of course, it's had an extra um, an extra story built onto it since uh, since he was born there in 1769. So you have this uh, family that, yes, it's got um, aristocratic escutcheon, or at least it got hold of it pretty quickly when um, Napoleon's father, Carlo, recognised that he could get free education for his children, military mm -hmm. uh, schools in France. But, you know, they were not, Corsica doesn't have an aristocracy in that sense anyway. You know, no one, right. nobody was a true aristocrat in, in Corsica because that's not the nature of and the topography and the history of the, uh, of the island. Um, plus, of course, it wasn't French until the year before um, Napoleon was born. Right. And so so the, this family didn't have any natural right to be, as you mentioned, king of uh, Spain, king of Holland, king of uh, Westphalia and so on. Right. Um, and uh, let alone the um, the, uh, the sisters having their own uh, duchies and the rest yeah. of it. So it's um, uh, so they only really would be able to be helpful and useful if they were extremely good at running their own countries which mm -hmm. they were not 
Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily all the way down their fault. Uh, Louis actually uh, essentially um, sympathised with the Dutch too much to be mm-hmm. able to be a good um, uh, satellite king, which was the whole point of him. Um, Joseph was fighting against an insurgency that started from 1808 pretty much onwards. And so that was always going to be uh, difficult. Um, but uh, but Caroline and, and Mura in Naples turn against him. There's no support there. Lucien turns against him much earlier on uh, than that and goes off to live in Rome. This is totally uh, unhelpful to Napoleon. Um, and although I'm sure she gave good uh, good sort of life advi- advice, Madame Mayer isn't really a, a major player. Um, and so it's difficult, um, even at the Battle of Waterloo, where Jerome is in charge of trying to, or at least 50% in charge of trying to take uh, Hougoumont, even there he lets him, his brother down. So it's hard to point right. from the referendum, um, the, the referendum uh, immediately after the Brumaire coup, onwards where Lucien is at least useful as interior minister right. really where that family actually helps um Napoleon yeah. and so wouldn't it have been better far better uh to have um instead appointed in each of these places sorry can I just buzz in my myself one thought that yep. Eugene wasn't bad as viceroy of Italy in fact True. Eugène sure. Beauharnais was 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 not a bad viceroy of Italy. So so let's take Eugène and Hortense out of this, not yep. least because they're not uh, siblings, of course, of uh, of Napoleon's or or blood relatives of Napoleon's. But right. um, with regard to the blood relatives, wouldn't it have been better instead to have appointed the most talented administrators in each of the places, like Westphalia or Holland or Spain or wherever, and um, and try to uh, govern through them instead yeah yeah or, or just give them a small duchy or burg like a small city to to live in or you know to give these people who have no experience being king or queen a kingdom uh was rather ridiculous but it was but he's he wanted to be the rudolph of his own dynasty as he right. said you know he wanted to start uh, the dynasty he recognized that all dynasties start somewhere with the Habsburgs they started with it started with Rudolf and he wanted to be the Rudolf but the yeah. thing is that it shouldn't have um it, it should have been his his uh, offspring um rather than his siblings right given this thing because I mean it's a bit like lightning striking that kind of genius um hits Napoleon but it doesn't uh, you know, it's it's not a bolt of lightning that also lightens up everything else around him. Yeah. Yeah. I've often said that, you know, just because I sit next to a genius and or, or take a class with a genius doesn't make me a genius. You know, it, it, yeah, there's no there's no osmosis um, yeah. in, uh, in in families uh, for genius. And we'll come back to that point here in just a minute. Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. Regarding Napoleon's military acumen, which beyond comparison, why do you think he and his armies ran circles around the other armies in Europe for, gosh, a good decade? Different reasons in different um, in, uh, when fighting against different enemies. I think it was he-, he was helped enormously by the Austrians' choice of generals. Yeah. Um, they, uh, especially in the Italian campaign, seventeen ninety six uh, to ninety eight Italian campaign. Uh, he was able to um, run rings around these people because he was 26 and they were in their 70s. Right. Them. You know, they were they were veterans of the of the um, Seven Years' War, and so it uh, uh, that was going to give him a head start anyway. Then right. there was the revolutionary zeal, the whole uh, idea that they were uh, imparting to Europe a new set of, of values and principles that um, were going to really radically alter the um, the whole um, the whole way of uh, of life and yeah you get that very much through the concept of meritocracy 
you know, when, he, when the French Revolution took place, um, up until that point, your place in the world, in society, was very much governed by who your father and grandfather had Correct. been. Um, yes. Whereas with Napoleon, you look at those 26 marshals, and half of them are the sons of barrel coopers and innkeepers and uh, domestic staff and so on. You know, they're working class people who have right. shown through their merit, through their bravery on the battlefield, through their capacity to um, to show leadership, um, that they can get to the top. And that, again, is something that, um, that you know, you didn't have in, in previous wars, was extremely useful. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual... The actual kit that um, and equipment that uh, Napoleon had at his um, at his um, for, to use wasn't that much different actually from what the French and Austrians and Prussians and and Russians and British were um, had been using you know for for some time mm-hmm. um, the the muskets and the cannon and so on but right. the way in which uh, it was organised um, partly by Napoleon, partly by the because of the books that he read on on um, military structures. The introduction of the core system um, was uh, was absolutely vital. And yes. then, of course, he did have some absolute geniuses like uh, Alexandre Berthier, his chief of staff, mm-hmm. who just knew how to um, to do staff work in a way that was frankly much, much better than any of the other um, generals that they were up against. So there you are. There's five reasons. I could <laughs> probably, if I if I scratch my head, come up with another five to explain what um, uh, what gave him that, that sort of special advantage. The drawback, of course, is that by 1812 or so, um, the other uh, countries had been um, studying Napoleon for long enough to adopt their own core system. For example, mm-hmm. you know, and actually learn from uh, from Napoleon. Agreed. Oh, sorry. Can I add one other thing that that's sure. very important? Please. Apolo- apologies for butting in, but um, the other one, of course, is the um, is the levee en masse uh, mm-hmm. of the revolutionary period of the early seventeen nineties. Essentially, uh, gave our armies to France that were far bigger um, than, uh, than armies they'd had before and also armies that they were likely to face. Now that also is, that side of things is over by 1812. Um, the, um, the other countries, uh, have, uh, instituted their own levé en masse by then, it, apart from Britain. And, um, and so that competitive advantage that they had was, uh, that sort of differential had, uh, had gone by 1812. Okay. Agreed with that one as well. Um, going back to my other point about um, generals and marshals, some of them had natural talent, some did not. I think Napoleon gets blamed unfairly for not teaching his marshals his style of warfare, but I've also pointed out that Beethoven or Mozart could give piano lessons to a thousand students, but that doesn't mean any one of these thousand will turn into a legendary composer. Do you think too much of the French army's success is attributed to Napoleon? Like, are the marshals and generals just scapegoats when things go wrong? Or do you think some of these guys had talent as well? Oh, I think a lot of them had, had um, very impressive talent. I really do. I, I mean, um, uh, like I'm sure the majority of your, uh, of your guests, uh, for me, Marshal Davout of course. is the, uh, is the uh, great exemplar. Uh, mm-hmm. I think he was he was up there with, almost with Napoleon uh, Napoleon's own uh, capacity as a uh, as a general and a and a commander. Mm-hmm. Um, Marshal Ney, tough as uh, tough as um, old leather, he was. You know, I, it's possible that he might have got PTSD by the end, of being in charge of the rear guard in the retreat from Moscow. But up until then, he was he was mm-hmm. fabulous. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, you, what they all had, Poniatowski, of course, as a cavalry commander, was really very special. As was Mura. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these 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 guys, they uh, of course had learned their trade long before they ever met Napoleon. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and even even the middle-ranking marshals, Ogero um, w- springs to mind, were extremely useful soldiers. You know, mm-hmm. uh, there are there are um, a few get beaten in. Um, in Spain, but that's but largely because they're up against Wellington, who was himself, you know, a great captain of the era. And uh, and yeah. if you're if you're going to have a battle between Marmont, say, and uh, 
uh, or even Massena and uh, and Wellington. Wellington's going to come off um, come off best and and did, but that doesn't really um, detract from the qualities of of Marmont and Massena in my view. So one of um, Napoleon's great uh, capacities was this choice of uh, his capacity to choose extremely good soldiers. I mean, mm. they weren't always uh, politically that um, trustworthy, Bernadotte, of course, being a country <laughs> example. That. And another problem was that he didn't always have them in the right place at the at the right time. He did when they were shooting across um, Europe in 1805 to, um, to fight the Austerlitz campaign. But mm. obviously, 10 years later, it would have done um, him much better to have left Salt back in Paris and to have had Davu on the battlefield of Waterloo and many Agreed. other and, and perhaps not given the battlefield battlefield commandership to Ney um, at, uh, on the day of Waterloo. But you know, by that stage, for political reasons and because of his um, his uh, 1814 abdication, he had far fewer marshals to um, to to work with. Indeed, yeah. Well, let's talk about, I want to talk about the empire's high points and low points. Let's start with a high point. Do you think, and I'm going to give you a number of options to choose from. I can you tell you right now. Uh, sorry, can I just butt in? And, and just, Please, go right ahead. And, ju- and just say Tilsit. Tilsit, okay. Tilsit's the apogee of the empire. It's the, it's the moment, you know, where um, it sort of, it doesn't get better than this. Uh, he's, uh, he's essentially befriended uh, Alexander I. He's, uh, he's defeated uh, everyone, he's uh, he hasn't made the series of tragic errors that start in 1808 in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, he's done all his, um, or at least instituted the vast majority of his reforms. Uh, his marriage is happy, and or at least you know he's got loads of mistresses, but uh, nonetheless. <laughs> uh, and it, we're um, in a in a in a real state where um, the the um, whole dynasty looks as though it's uh, it's going to be rock solid and uh, it's a it's a it's a wonderful moment for him yes the battle of trafalgar has, has meant that britain is uninvadable but mm-hmm. um but i think it it pretty much was um um was not going to be invaded once he had moved his armies across to fight the Austerlitz campaign anyway so so 1807 tilsit sorry to butt in but no that, worries. that's that that's the great uh, the great no moment worries. Just for my audience, uh, my other options were uh, Austerlitz in 1805 uh, or the birth of his son in 1811 because that, you know, somewhat solidified his, you know, heir to the empire and that kind of thing, which is why he divorced Josephine uh, in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. Tilsit. Uh, we'll now move on to low points. And if you want to jump in and tell me. Which <laughs> no, give me a, give me a series. I feel a bit guilty about having jumped in last time. So give, <laughs> so give me your, give me your low points. My God, there are enough of them, aren't there? So clearly his invasion of Portugal and Spain were a bad idea. Then he followed this up with a disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812. His major loss at Leipzig in 1813 was also devastating. His continental system was not well thought out. What do you think the low point was? I think it was uh, October 1812 at the Battle of Malayaroslavets, where he, re- where he uh, is stopped from uh, pursuing the Russian army. He has to take the dog leg back via the battlefield of Borodino, and he uh, and the winter is uh, is closing in. He's um, suddenly re- realizes that actually he needed more time to get from Moscow back to Smolensk than it took him. Uh, getting from Smolensk to Moscow. And uh, although he planned plan for that, um, after Malo Yaroslavets, um, it, is, it is pretty much downhill all the way. Yes, of course, you're right about Leipzig. And, but for me, these are, and of course, the 1814 campaign and the abdication and, uh, and so on, 100 days, you know, the, there are, you're replete with a whole series of, of low points. The meeting with Metternich, um, of course, also um, is a very, and Dresden is a very um, low point, but they all start from the um, from the catastrophe in Russia, and the catastrophe in Russia doesn't start until um, Malo Yaroslavets. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, from that moment, it was all downhill. There was nothing he could do to save the empire, because 
you know, the winter showed up, uh, the Russian army showed up and he lost a large chunk of his army right there. Yeah. Huge. I mean, over half a million men. Yeah. Which is impossible. And and horses, of course, as yeah. well. You've got to remember the horses because it's it's um, just as difficult, really, to um, to replace them. Um, yeah. And yeah. so you um, so you have a, a situation after that where um, he, he just doesn't have the cavalry for um, for big encircling movements. Now, that's not to say that he can't fight some extremely impressive battles. Look at uh, the four victories in five days uh, in the Champagne region in uh, in the March of um, 1814. But uh, but equally, that doesn't stop um, Marmont from uh, from surrendering Paris, you know, later on, later on um, uh, the following yeah. month. Yeah. Yeah, in uh, April 1814, he's exiled to Elba and lives there quite peacefully for a, a while. Uh, but against long odds, he famously returns and places himself back on the throne in 1815. Do you think if he'd won at Waterloo that he might have kept his crown, or do you think the Allies were determined to get rid of him once and for all? I think from from that uh, decision they took on the, uh, was it the 13th of March, 1815, where they declared him an outlaw? Mm. May, uh, Vienna made it perfectly clear that yes, even if he had won and pushed Wellington back to the Channel ports, and we had some kind of a Dunkirk 1940 style evacuation in uh, 1815, uh, yeah. he would still have had to have faced about 350,000 Russians that were on the march and 150,000 Austrians, you know. And one only has to look at that 1814 campaign to realize that yes, he can win victories. But he can't win them forever. Uh, and once Paris has fallen once, it's um, it's not impossible that it'll uh, fall again. So I think he's I think he's um, he's pretty his the chances of a Bonaparte dynasty uh, ruling in France are pretty much dead from the uh, from the declaration of him as an outlaw in the March of 1815 onwards. Mm, good answer. Well, he's exiled again in 1815 after Waterloo, this time to St. Helena, an island essentially in the middle of nowhere. What do you think his last years were like? I know I, I'm clearly not happy, but what do you think those those final few years were like? I think um, they were necessary for his myth, um, the, the St. Helena years. He also, of course, burnished his myth by writing the best-selling book of the 19th century, mm. uh, Memorials of St. Helena, are um, absolutely essential for the the burnishing of his uh, of his uh, sort of myth, the story of his epic. Um, but my God, were they uh, were they depressing for him? Of course, especially <laughs> after in eighteen seventeen he um, he's got cancer. But the um, but the early even before that, I mean, the moment when he actually sees the cliffs. And I've been on a on a on a ship that. Um, came into the harbour in St. Helena uh, at, uh, from the, exactly the same direction. And you have these huge cliffs, sort of four, 500 foot cliffs. And he said, uh, I, I wish I'd stayed in Egypt. Mm. <laughs> I can totally understand. When you go there, I can tell you, you can totally understand why, because it's, it's an island about eight miles by 10. There are right. 3,000 people who live on it now, 2,000 of which um, have left the island, but there are 1,000 people who have never left the island. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, from being master of Europe, you're then um, uh, interned on this on this tiny little island, which, as you say, is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it would have saved a lot of trouble and indeed 100,000 lives if uh, he'd been put, put on St. Helena rather than Elba in 1814. Right. But that wasn't the deal. You know, there was a there was a straightforward deal done with the Allies and um uh, and that wasn't uh, the deal. Equally, if he'd fallen into the hands of the Prussians, there's no saying whether they wouldn't have just hanged him right. in 1815. So, um, so you know, you need the St. Helena uh, option, really, um, if you're going to retain a kind of civilised way of dealing with him, unless you think he's Hitler and a war criminal, in which case, obviously, he deserved to be hanged. But, uh, but when you go to St. Helena, you very quickly... Uh, I don't want to be rude to anyone in St. Helena who might be listening to this, but you very quickly do recognise why it was um, destructive of Napoleon's soul mm -hmm. to have to spend um, five and a half years there. 
Yeah, and, and he probably, I would imagine, reflected on his mistakes or where he went wrong, whether it was Marmont or Bernadotte or invading Russia or, you know, it, to have six years to sit and reflect on how you had everything and now you have nothing. That must have been very destructive to his soul as well. Well, yes, and you see that, of course, from the memorials of St. Helena, but he doesn't, um, uh, he doesn't blame himself at any mm -hmm. stage. You know, there isn't, um, yes, of course, he had... Uh, he had long moments in which to think about where it all went wrong. But what he didn't use those moments in order to go, oh, damn, I wish I hadn't invaded the Iberian Peninsula and, and right. Russia at all. You know, there isn't there isn't that level of of uh, self-criticism. Uh, there's a good deal of self-pity um, right. in that. But but there's no, there's very little in terms of an actual um, recognition of um, of of having made mistakes there's a there's a lot about how unlucky um waterloo was for example mm -hmm. very little i mean there's not a word about the fact that wellington was an extremely good soldier and they were very well dug in and they had chosen their position very well and the anglo allied army performed excellently and his uh, cavalry charges didn't and you know none of the squares broke and all of this kind of thing there if if he had had a a deep maybe he did personally understand that it was uh, partly his fault but it wasn't going to fit into the napoleonic um, myth to admit as much mm -hmm. well he passes there i believe in 1821 um what do you think his legacy is though that's a tough question uh, it is, yeah, because it, and not least is it um, being battled over constantly. You know, in, in France today, uh, the left want to see somebody who um, who justified war crimes in Haiti, which he did do, mm -hmm. um, and who uh, kept women um, un subjugated by the Code Napoleon, which he also did do. The um, uh, the right look at uh, some of those. Things that we were mentioning earlier, the, the Banque de France, the Légion d'honneur, the uh, ways of uh, ruling France, the administration, saving France from the massive inflation, imposing law and order when there was virtual you know, civil war in the countryside, ending the reign of terror so that 40,000 people who'd been guillotined, you know, that stopped under him. So did mob rule stop under him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have a... Um, a, a literature, an art, a, a, a culture that was vibrant under him. There are just so many examples. When you go on your romantic uh, weekend to Paris, you're going to cross over, probably cross over one of the four bridges that he built. You know, mm -hmm. the reservoirs there, the, the sheer... Um, the sheer ability to sort of grip a nation that was in massive crisis and the directory was profoundly corrupt mm -hmm. and incompetent. And instead, uh, you you create a uh, a legacy that um, that has lasted and will last, I think, uh, long beyond the the carpers and the critics and the people who quite wrongly see him as having anything in in um, common with Adolf Hitler. You know, when his troops went into cities, mm -hmm. um, they opened up the. Um, the ghettos and they freed the jews and they gave them social and uh, and economic rights precisely mm -hmm. the opposite of of course of what the nazis were doing when they went into the ghettos right right yeah it's it's uh, he is a, a con contrast and compare and conflicting character like it's yeah he did some good things yeah he did some bad things but on the whole i think he made france better than it was when he got there. That's right. And also it's very important, you know, this this thing that he's a warmonger. Well, we've already mentioned the Iberian Peninsula and the 1812 campaign, and he was responsible for both of those. But those were two campaigns out of the seven wars of the coalition mm -hmm. that were fought between the um, outbreak of the French Revolution and 1815. And, you know, the Allies were responsible for the other five. What's he expected to do in 1805 when Austria... Uh, invades Bavaria, France's ally. Of right. course he has to go to war. He has right. to go to war in, in uh, 1800 over, um, over um, Austrian implications in, in Italy. The uh, Allies pick the fight with him in 1813 and again in 1814, and then they declare him a, um, uh, an outlaw in 1815 after he has been 
uh, he, he returns in triumph and mm-hmm. sits down and eats Louis the 18th's dinner at the Tuileries, you know. I mean, yeah. the, so I, out of the seven wars of coalition, he's responsible for two. The Allies, who understandably want to destroy this fresh wind of meritocracy, uh, mm-hmm. the, especially the Ancien Regime style um, uh, countries of uh, Prussia, Austria and Russia. And um, so, so let's get all of this into proportion about, um, about this so-called warmonger. When he invaded um, Russia in 1812, he had an army twice the size of the of the Russian army, but he only mm-hmm. wanted to go about 50 miles into Russia. He only wanted to have a sort of three-week campaign. The idea that he was actually ever going to wind up in Moscow was, uh, you know, would have con- he'd have considered that ludicrous in mm-hmm. June 1812. But it was it was a brilliant strategy of the Russians to essentially lure him in to uh, destroy half their country, half the European part of their country. Uh, high risk, but it, um, but it worked, of course, ultimately. Um, but you see, it doesn't mean that Napoleon had some kind of a Napoleon complex. There is such a thing as a Napoleon complex, it's just that Napoleon didn't have it. Hmm. He had, uh, he'd beaten the Russians twice before, and, right. uh, and he reckoned he could again. So the idea that he'd suddenly gone mad in 18, 18- 12 i think is um is ridiculous yeah i agree well thank you for that andrew that was fantastic i i i learned so much in our our chat there and i i think that's why there's so many books written about this man he's just fascinating and uh yeah i hope uh i hope you write some more for us on 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 napoleon if if you have time just before i go can i tell you another napoleon gag please remembered this is one of my favorite napoleon jokes uh which is when um, the Cardinal Archbishop of, of um, Ram writes to him an incredibly sucky, uppy, oleaginous letter about the coronation, <laughs> saying, saying how wonderful Napoleon is about everything and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Napoleon writes on the top right hand corner of the letter, which is when he where he gave sort of notes on what to do with uh, with this kind of with incoming correspondence. He said, please, can you pay? Um, uh, can't remember, was it 3,000 francs to the Cardinal Archbishop out of the theatrical fund? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a, bit, a bit too theatrical in his life. Exactly, exactly. He was he was being over theatrical. Yeah, I, I, like I, there's times where he can be funny, um, even on, on the battlefield. You know, he told Murat to, t- you know, take off his some of his flamboyant uniforms and put his, you know, regular officer's uniform on. Um, you know, I know he when Marshal Bessier was injured, he, he was joked that he was the only man that could make his guard cry. You know, I, I, he, he yeah. And, f- and Juno as well at uh, Acre, where the uh, where the cannonball uh, comes and, and flicks sand into uh, into everyone's uh, faces. He makes a joke uh, about that as well. It's a uh, no, yeah. it's, can you imagine having the coolness of the, the sheer sort of savoir faire? Yeah. of um of uh, to be able to make jokes during a battle yeah no that's that's impressive um well again um if you'd like to learn more about andrew roberts uh please check out his books uh, i recommend starting with napoleon a life but he has a fine list of books to choose from and um andrew i appreciate your time thank you so well, much I'm, I'm actually going to waterloo uh tomorrow morning i take uh i take um uh, visitors around the battlefield occasionally so um when i get to the top of the lion mound I will um, think of you. Please, please do. And uh, we appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks very much.